and we will dive straight in. Okay, so as I said, I'm big all about the chat. Please use the chat. This session is for you. The session is a chance to get your questions answered. I have more help coming for you guys at the end of the session. Um, so be around for that. First thing before we start is Kat, the lovely Kat is going to be talking later. I'm sure she's here. If she's not, I'm sure she will appear. Right, let's dive in. Who would like some more money in their business? I think that the answer is going to be lots of virtual hands up. If you've got your camera on, nod. If you haven't got your camera on because you're working or doing something else, stick something in the chat. But I have a strong feeling it's going to be quite a lot of yeses. I am going to share my screen and we can dive straight in. Okay, double your income. Sounds too good to be true, maybe for some of you. This session is all about more money in your business. Now, more money sounds really simple, doesn't it? We are going to be looking at not just more money, we're going to be looking at why you could be holding yourself back from more money. Oh, here is Kat. I was just talking, talking of the devil, Kat. So this is what we've got planned for you this evening. I'll come back to who I am in a minute. Let me tell you what we're going to do first. We are going to look at how to make more money. I am going to walk you through the high ticket offer. We've got a big chunk on money and you because your relationship with money, how you think, feel, behave around money is massive. Say so money blocks, or watch out. And then you've got your high ticket offer. What the heck do you do with it? We're going to have a little bit of a talk about launching it, bringing it to the world. And as I said, you're going to hear from Kat, one of my awesome clients who has smashed the high ticket offer. Kayla, I've got lots of clients with high ticket offers. Uh, and Kat very kindly agreed to speak. Kaylin was also hoping to join us, but I don't think she could make it with a time difference. But I have lots of living proof of high ticket offers that all work. And as I said, Kat is living and breathing the high ticket dream. But for those of you that haven't met me before, I did just want to introduce myself briefly. So I'm Nicola Kennard Comedy. I own and run NKC Equestrian Training, two sides to my business, training for owners. It's all about care and getting the right information to people with qualified vets and then business coaching for equine practitioners. I love helping people with their money mindsets and I am so passionate about helping practitioners to grow their businesses. I know what it's like if you feel stuck in business. I know what it's like if you don't have a plan. I know what it is like if you just want someone to show you the way. And I feel so inc incredibly privileged to help people with their businesses because I get it, like your business is like a baby. You pour all your love, your time and your attention into your business. I know I have done with mine. And then if it's not quite going to plan, it's hard. And I feel so grateful to be entrusted to help people with their businesses, I really do. So uh, job satisfaction in NKC HQ is off the scale. I'm very happy to report, but if you haven't met me before, I do have lots and lots of practical horsey experience. I've been in the equine world for, oh my goodness, 20 years. I feel so old when I say that. I started my horsey journey as a freelance riding instructor. I've run big equestrian centers around the world. So I've run my own freelance business. I've run other people's businesses and I have also grown and scaled my own business from one course on my phone to this, which is pretty cool. So I feel well placed to help you all this evening. Okay, we've talked about what we're going to talk about. Let's get into it. Remember, guys, this is your session. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Use the chat. Don't just sit there. Oh, oh. Ask it, okay? Because if you've got a question and you're not sure, there's a strong chance somebody else is thinking the same thing. So please, please, that is my request for you this evening. I've got two requests, actually. No, three. <laughs> okay, three requests. One, Quit the multitasking, it's so easy. I've been there, you're like, yeah. Doing reports, cooking the dinner, webinar. Right, just do one thing, okay? Just do one thing at a time, firstly. Secondly, be an action taker. 
I've said this so many times, every time I present, I'm like, right, give this all you've got, don't multitask, and then do something with this information afterwards. My third request is if you feel stuck, don't feel stuck alone. Use the chat. I'm going to share with you at the end how you can get a little bit more help. It's not a sales call. Don't panic. It's free, additional free help. Use it. Okay. I have got a shed load of energy. I am here to help people. I've got some amazing information to share with you this evening. I would love you to actually do something with the information. Okay. So we're not going to just be note takers. Like, I've got a notebook here. Don't just stick it in there and leave it on the shelf. Do something with this because this can make a massive difference. Okay, so how can you make more money? Answers on a postcard, please. What have you tried? What have you not tried? Um, I would love to hear. So, things you may have already tried. Increasing your prices. How did that work out? Now, I would love, like I can't see everyone's faces. You're gonna to have to use the chat. If I said, put your price up, how does that make you all feel? Who literally feels like, oh my God, I think I'm gonna be sick in my mouth. Who is like, yeah, I could do that. But then when it comes to telling people, yeah, it doesn't quite work. And who is just like, that's just not even a possibility. So there's one thing you can do, and this is not my solution for this evening's training. Increase your price is something you can do, but you must feel aligned to doing that. But it's something you could do to make more money. But what I find is people find that quite hard. And then they end up with this like crazy multi-tiered pricing option where they're like, well, people I knew five years ago, they pay this, or oh, they've always paid the same rent. People I was at a livery yard with two years ago, they pay this and so forth. So increasing your price works well in lots of businesses but I find with horsey people it's never that straightforward so you might have tried it did it work did it not work let me know in the chat I'd love to know if you want more money you might be thinking oh I've just got to work more and let's face it I know some of you are joining us from warmer parts of the world but for those of us in the UK it's just turned muddy it's got rainy and it's been a bit cold a couple of times. Like it's not feeling appealing. It's not shorts weather. It's not that time of year when horses are like really easy and it feels fun to work really late in the evening because it's still sunny and warm and lovely. This is not really the time of year to want to work longer hours. So if you've tried going, right, I need more money. Prices is one thing you might try, but working more hours is something you may have tried. And some of you might have just gone, well, I just need some more dosh. I'm going to get another job. And there's nothing wrong with having <clears throat> an additional income while you're building up your business. In fact, I'm all for people having a job and building their business up on the side. But if your business is more established and you're getting to that point where you're just like, I need more money, this isn't working. A job is not the answer. If you have clients, but you don't have the income and you're busy, but you don't have the income you want, a job is not the answer. And I know what it feels like when you have a quiet day and then you're like, oh, maybe this isn't working. Maybe I should get a job or a quiet day turns into like a quiet week. And it's really easy to think that a job perhaps is the answer. But honestly, I believe there is a simpler option. I really do. Bum, bum, bum. I feel I need a drum roll. The high ticket offer. You're gonna hear what this is, but trust me, this is, in my opinion, the simplest way and the most effective way to bring more income into your business without you needing to necessarily put up your prices, work more hours or have a second job. Because increasing your prices is a sensible thing to do when you feel aligned to it. But increasing your prices and then being too scared to tell anybody is not a sensible thing to do at all. So high ticket offer. As I said, I feel I need a drum roll for that one. So what on earth is a high ticket offer? You hear me talk about this all the time, but what on earth is it? High ticket offer is basically the VIP option. It is a chance for a limited number of people. And remember a high ticket offer is never gonna be for everybody to get more of you basically. They get more done for them 
they get more access to you, your skills, your talents, your training, whatever it is you want to offer, and they pay more for that. And like I said, it's never going to be for everybody, but it is so, so sensible for your business to have this in place. It really, really is. What a high ticket offer is not, because I want to make sure everybody is crystal clear. And guys, use the chat. Ask me any questions that you wish. So a high ticket offer is not the same thing. It's not your, if you think of your in-person treatments, your bread and butter treatments, it's not just that and you just like double the price. It's not the same thing for a higher price. A high ticket offer is never going to be for all of your clients. <gasps> and that can make people feel really weird, actually. That can make people feel like, oh my goodness, how can I bring something out? It's not going to be for everybody. Or people are going to say, no, panic, panic. That's a high ticket offer will not be for everybody. It will require some work on you. It's not going to be necessarily easy, but it is doable. And it is not a trick. It's not a scam. It's not a con. And quite often when you talk about putting something together, which costs more money, it just brings up all these feelings and all these fears. So if you're sitting there thinking, oh, I couldn't do this. Firstly, yes, you could. And two, I'm going to pave the way for how you can do this in a few moments. So are we clear on what it is and what it isn't? <clears throat> Let me give you some more examples. High ticket offer. I think of this as being very similar to the best seats at a show, the, the membership at like in the UK, there's some, we have, we are so lucky. We have badminton, we have Burley Blenheim, we have Windsor, we have these amazing shows. And you can go, and then you can go to these places in style. So I don't know who's been on the VIP membership side of, sides of these places, but this is something that I love doing. You can go to, say, Windsor or Badminton, you can get a different price ticket. There's not that many. It's exclusive. You get your own fancy marquee. You get special toilets, which you don't have to share with everybody else. You get access to a private bar. You get, sometimes you get food, sometimes you don't, depends what package you've gone for. You just get a select bit, yeah? You get better seats, you get access to the ring and you pay for it. And in my experience, it's really worth paying for because you get such a great, uh, you get such a great day. It really is a lovely feeling. Another example of a high ticket offer is full livery. So where everything is done for you and your horse, all you've got to do is just pitch up, get on when you want to, because the horse will be exercised the rest of the time, get off again. Yeah, hand back your horse, job done. Again, that's not for everybody, but there are many, many people who want that, yeah? Are we feeling clear on what a high ticket offer is? So it doesn't matter if you're like, oh, I don't know what I'll do in my business, we'll come to that, we'll come to that. I just wanna paint the picture of what this actually looks like because this is, this is in existence everywhere in our lives. It's the exclusive, it's small numbers, higher price, not for everybody, bigger, better, bolder, brighter experience. Yeah, does everybody feel clear on what this is? Please say, if you do not, if you're thinking, oh, what is she talking about? This is your moment to say so, okay? So that's what a high ticket offer is. We're clear on what it isn't as well. It's not a con, it's not a trick, it's not a scam. It's not for everybody. And it's not just repackaging up the same thing and with a higher price, it's something different, okay? Now let's look into, let's go all mystic. Let's look into your resistance. Why would you not want to do this? Like this is sounding great, is it not? So what is potentially stopping you? Okay, are we ready guys? Are we ready to do a bit of digging into some beliefs you may have? You and money. Now, even just <coughs> sharing a shot of loads of loads of money, will be making some of you feel like, oh, because 
we have all kinds of crazy thoughts and beliefs around money. And in the horse world, I think we have our own particular set of money blocks. We really, really do. So let's dive in. How is it you feel about money? Okay. When I share a picture of money, when I say, put your prices up, when I say, how much money do you make? When I say, how much money do you want to make? Things are coming up. So write it down, what is it? And share in the chat. That is no right or wrong answer. So you might associate money with fear. You just might be like, oh, this is never enough, never enough, never enough, never enough. It might, it may feel fearful for you. Money may feel like a source of worry and that could stem from not having enough or it could stem from you feeling like you don't have control of it or maybe somebody else in your life has spent your money before, so worry could be there. Perhaps that's something you saw growing up, people worried about money. You could be like, oh, I love money, money's great, money gives me freedom, money gives me choices, money's fab. You could feel like, oh, I want money, but I kind of feel somehow like it's not good to want money, I should be doing my job for the love of it, not for the money. You might feel like, Money's just not for me. So what is it that you feel? And there's a whole load of other things. You might feel guilt, you might feel shame, you might feel uncomfortable. It's certainly in the UK, it's, when well, I'm really old now, when I was a child, which feels like a long time ago, it felt like it was wrong to talk about money. Now that could have just been my household, but I don't really think it was. I think culturally in the UK, we got a real issue talking about money. And although I was raised largely in the UK, I just, like, I'm really un-British in some ways. And I've never had a problem talking about money. And I've spent time in Greece. I lived in Greece. Uh, my husband is part Romanian, part Greek. And we spend time in Romania as well. And they just do not have any issue talking about money in the slightest. And I love that. And I just do not have that English... British reserve around money, but so many people do. And you know, if you're a, if you're a Brit, like, do you feel like, oh, money's gotta be hushed up. Like it's wrong to talk about it. You shouldn't ask about money, you shouldn't want money. Tell me all the things because do you know what? They're already in your head. You may not be consciously aware of them, but these thoughts, this programming that money's bad, that money isn't for you, that money causes worry, that money causes stress, that money's out rich for you, money's not for people like you, money doesn't grow on trees, all this stuff is, is controlling everything in your business and life. It really is. So let's hear what we say. Okay. Excitement and motivation to work hard, brilliant. So when I say to you, Lucille, money, you're like, yeah, I feel excited, I want it, brilliant, I love that. Uh, a guilt for taking people's money when they pay me. Fantastic, Dana, thank you so much for sharing that. We're gonna talk about that. That is so, so common. I used to feel that, when I was a freelance writing instructor, I priced really high. Where I trained, everybody priced really high. And you know what? I was just like, I'm gonna try this too. Like I'm incredibly determined and motivated. I've always been a strong action taker. And I was like, oh, I'm going to do this and see if I can get with it. And people paid it. And I was like, way, amazing. But then sometimes I would ride someone's horse. Oh, I would just teach a lesson in the sun. Someone's brought me a cup of tea. And I'd feel like, I should pay you. Like, this is too good to be true. Like, this is really fun. So I get that. I get, and we're going to dive in a bit more into that, that guilt for taking people's money when they pay me. But there's so much connected with feeling bad when it's your passion. So feeling like making a profit, making money from your passion can feel, feel wrong. It is not wrong, but there is programming in there that can make it feel like, oh, this feels too good to be true, this won't last, that kind of thing. Vicky, used to worry, but now feel good after lots of mindset work. Vicky is in my mastermind. That's why she feels great because we've done so much subconscious work. Feel too inexperienced and unconfident asking clients to pay Thank you so much for sharing that. So that's one of your um, money blockers. 
So what's your main thing around money, Leone? Is it that I can only get money if I'm been practicing for 20 years, have done every single course going, what is it? Dig into that, I'd love to know. Um, <clears throat> used to think I would spend it on the wrong things. Oh, not worthy of it. It's like if you had more money, you, you wouldn't do good with it. Yeah, so maybe you probably repelled the money cap. In terms of my business, I view money as a tool. Great, but not just in terms of your business. What is your deep down, Lena, your first reaction to money? If I say, right, what do you think about money? What is the first thing that comes up? Our family didn't talk about money either. I feel bad asking people to pay. Yeah, ah, oh, I love it. So it is so common this like oh you mustn't talk about money and it's such a load of rubbish in my opinion but culturally it's definitely a thing in the UK lessening now but definitely a thing when I was a child uh over deliver because you feel bad taking people's money and you know what over delivering one is not sustainable two is exhausting three if you like over delivering Gillian you're going to love a high ticket offer because it, you get to deliver more, but it has a different price attached to it. Okay, so great. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. And as I said, there is no right or wrong answer, but you've got to get this stuff from swirling around your head, even if you're not consciously aware of it, to being out on a piece of paper is ideal so you can deal with it. Okay, next question for you. How was money talked about when you're a child? Now I've mentioned in the UK, hush down, oh, don't talk about money. Bad manners talk about money. You shouldn't ask what something cost, something I heard. Money doesn't grow on trees. I can remember my mum saying that to me when I was little. We had this lovely house. Now I literally had the most idyllic upbringing. We had a lovely house, we were on lovely holidays super super upbringing we, you know couldn't have didn't want for anything it was really lovely I remember my mum saying that and I can remember so clearly I was probably about six seven and we had a really big garden and we had like a little, little mini orchard at the end of it and I was looking down at these apple trees feeling so confused I really did and it was just like the idea when people say money doesn't grow on trees it's the idea like money is limited like you can't get more money and you know that number of years ago it probably was harder to get more money i think now we live in a time where you can create money if you wish you have your own business this is the coolest thing ever because you can create as much money as you want in your business you might not believe that right this exact second but trust me you can you can put together whatever offers you want. You can get them to the right people. You can get behind them and truly believe them and people will buy them and people will pay for them. So money doesn't grow on trees. If that is something you've been conditioned to feel and believe, you're going to have to do some work on that because as I said, you, you now have the option to pretty much make money grow on trees, which is really, really cool. And anyway, money was paper for a long time, so it did kind of grow on trees, didn't it? But you get where I'm coming from, that whole idea that it, there's scarcity, it's going to run out, can't want any more because there isn't any more, that sort of thinking. Greedy, did, greedy to want more, like, you should be happy with what you've got, don't ask for more. Is that, is that a feeling that anybody had when they were a child? rich people are wankers now whenever I say if I've got American people I say the word wankers I seem to find it really funny um but maybe that's just a UK expression but rich people are basically like idiots and um, they're bad they're greedy it's wrong that may have come from your family that may be just something that's a message I think was definitely around in the media still sometimes is yeah like I'm not going to lie, I don't ever watch TV until I got addicted to selling Sunset last year and it's coming back for another season, which I do feel excited about. And there's people with enormous wealth in that programme and sometimes they are portrayed as total idiots. So I think so often this isn't just exactly what your parents said, this is all the influences that were on, around you when you were little and some of that is mass media, films, TV programmes, family friends, family, other family members, as well as your immediate family. 
So yeah, what what did you learn and hear about money when you were little? Don't ask for any more. You've got to wait for your birthday. You can't have that. Or you could have come from a, a situation where there was loads of money and you think, oh, if you grew up with loads of money, you wouldn't have any money blocks. But you know what? Interestingly, you can actually have even more money blocks because whatever you've got, I think particularly if you are in the upper echelons of wealth, there's always somebody with more. Uh, and I think that can leave you in as much of a lax state as if you were growing up in poverty. It's just very, very different feel, but I think you can still end up with a real lack feeling. Uh, over delivered to make sure I've earned the money. Yeah, so it's like this. You're only worthy of the money if you've like basically bust your backside for it. Um, taught to save and work hard. And you know, I think saving is a great thing. I really, really do. And I think you can have some brilliant experiences from being taught to save. And working hard, it's how we define working hard, isn't it? It's working hard to the limits that we want to work. And I think when, I think sometimes you can be taught that you've got to kind of like work to the bone to make what you want. So it's really, really interesting to hear people's experiences. Again, there's no right or there's no wrong answer to this. The reason this section is so important is you cannot bring something to life where you're asking people for more money if you have these blocks. Everybody has these blocks. It's just working out what are your particular blocks and how we can deal with them, start to loosen them up, start to get rid of them because you're gonna find it really hard otherwise. And what I want to leave you with today is be ready to take action. I don't wanna leave you with an idea and then all this mental block so you can't take the action. Yeah, because I don't think that's very effective training. I want to give you the tools and I want to free you from holding yourself back so you can put this into place. Okay, so that's how money was talked about when you were a child. And <clears throat> next question, how do you define yourself with money today? Because I find people tend to fall into the, one of these four categories. They're either like, I'm a saver. I save, I save, I save, I save. Now I like saving money. The own, and I think saving money is a real positive. Where saving money can be a negative is when you don't want to spend it on things that are sensible to spend money on. When you don't want to make an investment in your business. When you are wearing wellies with a hole in, because you're like, ah, save myself 100 quid. You're like, yeah, your feet are wet. Like, that's, that's not sensible. Saving can also, being too tight a save, well, tight is maybe not the right word. When saving turns into tightly holding onto money, that can be a problem. Money needs to flow. Money needs, to, money's energy. Money needs to flow in and out. That doesn't mean you've got to spend money to make more money, but it means that some money is inevitably going to go out of your life because that's how we live. And then more money comes in. So when people are like, I hold onto every single penny, that's when it's the wrong kind of energy. So Saving money is really sensible. It really, really is. But just watch the energy. Are you saving out of fear? Are you saving with a plan? You know, that's totally different, isn't it? If you're like, right, saving for my wedding, saving for a house deposit, saving to pay off my credit card. Brilliant. Saving and still having a life. Saving and being kind to yourself. Saving without a poverty mindset. Amazing. Saving yourself, as I said, 50 quid and walking around with boots with a hole in. Not good. Saving because you're too scared to invest in yourself and your business. Maybe there's a course you want to go on. Maybe you want some more help with your business. Maybe you want to invest in a machine, something like that. And you're just like, oh, what if no more money comes? I've got to hold on, hold on to every penny. Wrong energy. So saving is great watch those caveats. Are you the spender? Are you like, yeah, money comes in. Oh, it's all gone. Where do they go? Loads of people are like that. Um, th that's obviously a problem. Like your business should be making some money and you need to feel worthy of like holding on to some of that money. You don't want to feel like, and it's really easy to do this. You're like, oh, 
oh, I've, I've made some money and I really enjoyed it. Like, oh, if you feel bad for making the money, you'll find that you've brought yourself lots of nice treats. And I'm not against that, but there's got to be a balance. You've, I don't know, given some money to a friend or a family member. You've donated loads to something else, you know, and that's all, these are all really nice things to do from the, from surplus, not from getting rid of every single penny because you didn't feel worthy of that money. Yeah, see the difference. So it's all about having overflow. It's all about having income, having some to spend, having some to save, having some to invest, and then having kind of fun money, having overflow, which you can go, yeah, do you know what? I'm buying that, I don't know, jumper for a hundred pounds or yeah, do you know what? I just sent my best friend a bunch of flowers, next day delivery, don't even care what it costs because she hasn't been very well or whatever. So spending, is that you? Is it spending every penny? Is it spending with intention? There's a big way to look at it. Are you someone's like, yeah, I'm good with money? Great. Good with money sounds really sensible. Just watch though that if you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm good with money, I'm good with money. You aren't like trying to control all the money. You aren't trying to live up to that because I think sometimes people are like, yeah, yeah, I'm good with money, good with money. And then they'll be like, yeah, I've actually, I've got a credit card. I've got this debt. I didn't tell anyone about it. So watch that you don't like pigeonhole yourself and then get in a bit of a pickle. I do, I have seen that before. Or are you somebody that tells yourself on repeat, yeah, I'm, I'm rubbish with money. I'm, I can't manage money. I don't know what to do with money. I don't get money. Oh, I'm rubbish at math. Like I hear this kind of stuff all the time. Now, if you're an old person like me, when I was at school, math is not my strong point, okay? But you know what? I've got an, I've managed to work out maths enough to run a really successful business. Um, <laughs> but when I was at school, maths in my head is still not my strong point. I remember being told, well, you'll have to learn your times tables or whatever, because you'll never have a calculator available all the time. And every time I pick up my, uh, my smartphone and use the calculator, I literally feel like, ha! I didn't need to be that great and that's because I've always got a calculator with me so what is it you're telling yourself I'm a saver I don't let anything out I just spend it like there's never enough there's, I've got more months than I've got money I'm good with money or I'm bad with money what is it you're telling yourself because this stuff really matters I'm just going to dive into the chats okay let's see let's see I love money yay you can tell the people that I've worked really hard with and help them get rid of their, their limiting beliefs love investing in your life your business your growth amazing and cat is a great example of investing so true um things I could buy to facilitate my business but I'm just starting up so I I totally understand not wanting to get heavily into debt when you're just starting the business. Totally understand that. And in fact, I was coaching somebody on, they had a real block. I was coaching somebody earlier this week about they didn't have money to start the business. I was like, you can start your business for free. Like you've got the qualifications, you've got a phone, you've got a computer, like you, you don't need to spend loads of money at all. Um, but just watch that you aren't holding yourself back. I think that's the most important thing, Gillian. So it's, you. I don't think you need to spend money to start your business at all. Just watch you don't get stuck in that, oh no, I'm not, I'm not spending on the business because time can progress, but your mind doesn't always catch up. I'm a spender, not very good at managing a budget. See, this is so interesting. What you tell yourself is what you get, is what you are. I'm a spender good with money, brilliant, saver, but never know what to spend it on. Don't think I'm stingy, but not a forever spender. Brilliant. And as I said, saving with the right intention is really, really powerful. It's really useful. It's when it's the tightness, it's fear. Like I can't let it out because more won't come. If I spend this, I'll never see it back. Like it's the wrong energy. Uh, I saved and splurred. Oh, Jess, what do you splurge? I'd love to know. Uh, I flitter um, when high profile 
clients. I'm a spender when I'm not. I'm a spender but feel guilty for spending after investing. Well, that's really interesting. And I think it really depends what you're spending on. Like, why do you feel guilty? I'd love to know. Is it because you've bought, I don't know, loads of shoes, which you're never going to wear because you spend a lot of time in wellies? Or have you actually made a sensible choice in investing something that's going to grow yourself, your business, or maybe it's something to develop your um, riding skills? Love to know. So absolutely fascinating, guys. Thank you so much for sharing. Keep the sharing up. Keep the energy up. Keep getting the stuff out of your head because do you know what? Nobody is judging you. Everybody has these blocks and the horse world, you know, I've said this before, I will say this again, the horse world, we have our own unique limiting beliefs. In the horse world, there is people who literally have what appears to be nothing, but still have a horse. And there's people who have five horses in full livery and they would barely notice it coming out of the bank account. It's, that is just the small chains out there account. And that's great. But what that means is whatever you've got in the horse world, somebody has more. So it's so easy to be in a massive state of lack around money when you're in the horse world. Coupled with, all you hear is you can't make money with horses. It's really hard with horses. Oh, you should get a proper job, all the rest of it. So when you, every single person walking around has got money blocks. But when you're involved with the horse world, you have an extra set. So it's so important to get all this stuff out. Right, let's do something with this. Let's get rid of something. I would like you to look at what you've written, what you've thought, and pick one overriding emotion. So for those of you that was like, oh, guilt, I feel guilty. I feel bad for taking people's money. Maybe that is the, the strongest one. Take one thought feeling around money. So maybe it is, <clears throat> I feel guilty. I feel I've got to earn it. I feel like money's hard to come by. I feel like I've got to, you know, work to the bone, I've got to over deliver to, to have it. I don't feel worthy of money. Like drill into one feeling and we are going to do a little exercise to get rid of that feeling. So, what I'd like everyone to do is let's just make sure everyone is in a place where they feel able to just ah, chill and close your eyes for a few moments. That's what I'm going to ask you to do. So if you need to change location, then this is your moment to do so. What I want everyone to do is close your eyes. Move, move rooms if you need to, but I want everyone to close your eyes. If you're watching and listening to the replay, do not do this while driving. So close your eyes. I want you to tune in to this main feeling that you have. So the guilt, the worry around money, the fear, the feeling that it's hard, there's not enough, it's going to run out, whatever it is, tune into that feeling. And then I want you to just picture a timeline with your you are where you are. I want you to look down onto where you are right now. And I want you to just think back through previous memories. And I want you to ask yourself, when did I first feel like this? Give yourself a moment if you need to. When did I first feel guilt around money? When did I first feel fear that money would run out? Whatever it is. And your mind will take you to an event, it's likely to be when you're relatively young, maybe when you're older, but see where it takes you. And just nod when you have something. So just nod your head when it is taking you somewhere. And if you're new to mindset work, just go with this. Even if you're thinking, this is sounding crazy go with it because it's so incredibly valuable and so powerful. Okay, so I'm seeing quite a few nods. So what I want you to do is look down to this event that your mind has taken you to when you first felt this feeling. And I want you to ask yourself, what are the lessons? What are the learnings that 
that I can take from this event. So you're looking down on it, you're seeing yourself, what you saw then, what you heard, what you felt, what you saw, smelt, everything. What are the lessons you need to take? Because the reason we still have the same feelings, we feel these things on repeat, is because your subconscious needs you to learn from these events. The reason we get the same feelings come up, you get the same experiences dished up again and again and again, you feel guilty, you feel like you can't put your prices up, you feel bad when people pay you money, you feel like people will say no, you feel like you've got to over deliver, you feel like you've got to work yourself to the bone, it's because there's lessons that you need to take. So look down on this event and ask yourself, what are the lessons, what are the learnings that you need to take? And how, what are the positive life lessons you can take? And when you have a couple, think, what does that mean for me and my business right now? This is an exercise I do all the time. I do this with my mastermind clients. I do this on myself as well. Um, and when I look back, I just described that feeling. I was like six or seven, looking out a little mini orchard, going, mine doesn't grow on trees. As my mom just said, I feel really confused. When I look down on that event, the lessons that I take from that, and I've so clear that, like I just don't feel that confusion anymore. When I first sex was, the lessons that I took were things like, that was my mom's belief. That's not mine. Things like, that's what she felt. I've got different options now. Things like, I can make the money that I want to make. Money might have felt limited for my parents because there were less avenues that they could make it. But that's not the same for me. And when you look back on early money experiences, I tend to find people feel, they come out of this and feel like, ah, I've been using someone else's thoughts. I've taken on someone else's money beliefs. These aren't actually mine. So when you've taken some lessons, I want you to check in with that feeling how strong is it now? So say it felt like an eight out of 10. How does it feel now? You should find that it has decreased. If it hasn't, don't worry. You have more lessons to take. So simply ask yourself, what else do I need to learn? What else do I need to take from this event to release this feeling of? guilt, fear, shame, scarcity, whatever it is. Nod your head when you've got some lessons, when you feel like, uh-huh, yep, you've got some takeaways. And let's see where we are. This is such a powerful exercise. If you're thinking, oh, it's really hard to do it. Don't worry, there's no right or wrong answer. Any, any word, any phrase that comes to mind is perfect. You don't have to analyze, you don't have to make it mean something. What are the first, you know, if you say, what do I need to learn? Your subconscious will tell you the answer. Just let yourself hear the answer. That's all you need to do. And when I think I don't know what else to take, this is what I ask myself. I always say this to myself. If I did know, what would I say? And then you'll probably find you get another lesson. So I'm gonna give you all a couple more moments. Everyone's doing so well. I just love seeing everyone's concentration. Um, this is so powerful. This is such a great way to release some of these feelings. And when you've been carrying the thoughts feelings programming around for years, it can take several goes at getting rid of a feeling. Like it's not just, oh, I'm just gonna believe something new. Like it's a deep rooted, hardwired into your brain. It's gonna take a bit of work to get rid of it. But this is the first step. Thank you everybody so much for digging in. 
feeling all these uncomfortable feelings and doing it. You are so ahead of the pack. You really are because most people don't want to tune in to feelings that make them feel uncomfortable. So they just bat them away, they just ignore them. And, you know, money blocks, I suppose it's like an iceberg. It's always gonna be there under the surface. Okay, I'm gonna bring everybody back into the room. So what I want you to do is float back along your timeline, float back through events you know that have happened, maybe your most recent birthday, last Christmas. Look down on yourself now in your room, being part of this call. When you're ready, float back into now, back into your body and open your eyes. And amazing. I'd love to hear some of your takeaways. If you feel free to share them in the chat, that would be amazing. But as I said, this gets such powerful results. It really, really does. So feel free to share your biggest takeaways from the exercise in the chat. I would love to hear but generally people find that they've taken on other beliefs that they weren't even theirs. They didn't even know that they felt like that. So I would love to hear everyone's takeaways from the exercise. And as I said, well done guys for digging in, feeling the uncomfortable feelings and getting rid of them. That's absolutely fantastic. So yeah, share your takeaways. Can't wait to hear. Here's some other ways that helped me overcome money blocks. I had to, at some point, decide I was good enough. So I did lots of subconscious work on this, but I also made a conscious choice that was like, right, I'm just gonna have to go with where I am right now is good enough. And that really helped. Yes, the deeper work helps massively, but I'm still like, okay, I've either, I've got a choice, I can either, feel like I'm not good enough. And for me, feeling not good enough really was a problem as a rider. Sometimes as a, as a riding instructor, not so much in this business, but as a rider, oh my goodness, that was such an issue for me, it really was. So deciding that I was just, this was gonna, I was just gonna have to accept that I was good enough as I was, really helped. Um, but on the business front, business success list, making a list of all the things you have achieved in your business already, whether you've been in business five minutes or five years, it's a great exercise. What, who are the horses you've helped? What are the feedback people have given you? What about that horse that everyone said was a total write-off and you helped it come round? Like get that success list written, it's so good. Epic life list, like I, I feel really proud of some of the things I've achieved in my life, I really do. Like going on a 10k bike ride with my two-year-old yesterday. I felt quite chuffed with that. I've been on my bike for ages. It can be bigger things, but they can be small things as well. But feeling good enough, feeling proud of your accomplishments really helps with your money blocks because so many people feel blocked around not good enough, not worthy, don't deserve the money. Yeah, that can be a real blocker. Taking steps to feel abundant. I think I've got this on another slide, but one of my favorite things to do is tracking income. I sometimes do it in my life, but sometimes just do it in my business and value. So I, I was sharing this with my master, my clients the other day, my neighbor swept up all of the leaves at the front of my house. I didn't even realize he'd done it. And I went out, I was like, why is it different? I said, like, oh, wow. Like Ian's taken like all the leaves out of our front drive. That's so kind of him. I wrote that down on my family list that evening. I was like, yeah, what's the value? That's like I had a free gardener for an hour or two. Amazing. And um, all the things that come into your life, which you don't pay for, but are value. You know, somebody, even a friend makes you a cup of tea, someone buys you a coffee, friend bakes you a cake or something. Um, somebody... Um, oh, one of my one of my mummy friends dropped around a massive bag of apples and carrots for the horses earlier. Brilliant! I go on my value list. So it's it's possible to do that. Feeling like you're worthy can be so small steps like wearing your nice clothes. All the clothes because horsey people tend to have loads of nice clothes, never get warm. Horsey clothes horsey posh clothes that don't get worn as much competition stuff and they just like wear this limited selection of stuff well why don't you wear your going out top your posh jeans whatever even if you're sitting there doing your admin 
trust me, you'd have to muck out in a ball gown, but you can really feel much richer, much more abundant, much more deserving and worthy when you start acting like that. Acting as if, like, if I wave my magic wand and you had 3,000, 5,000, 10,000, whatever it is you want in your business right now, how would you behave? How would you feel? How would you look like? What would you do? What would be different? I'm sure you can drill into those feelings. So act like that now. Being grateful for every penny that does come into your life and changing my relationship with money. Like being nicer to money. Now that might sound crazy. You think like, how are you not nice to money? Um, and there's so much more we can drill into in another session. But if you feel in a state of lack, it's not the right energy. So these are some of the many things I've done to overcome my own money blocks. And I hope that helps you too. Now, I find, or let me just drill into everyone's takeaways. I wanted to see that imposter syndrome. You have more self-belief. Ah, oh, yeah. I think it's so easy to take on other people's beliefs and not realize. Um, I've already done and overachieved and overcome the barriers I think were there. No need to worry about the about future at all. Oh, that's amazing, Jess. What a fabulous takeaway. I love that. Already done it. That is brilliant. Such a powerful exercise. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. Okay. Money, guilt, and shame. This is my, I think it's my last slide on money, and then we're going to back to high ticket offers. But you can see why we need to talk about money. We need to talk about money because it's no good going, right, here's how you make a high ticket offer. Right, off you go. When you've got all this, this crap, basically, swirling around your head, oh, I'm not good enough, or people won't charge that. Oh, how can you bring something else out? How can you launch another package, another program, a high ticket offer, if you don't quite feel worthy like people will pay you etc etc so money guilt and shame what an awful triangle but I feel like lots of people are stuck in this one so several things to say it's okay to be paid for your passion and that can take a while to get your head around like I mentioned how sometimes I used to get off these amazing horses people would hand me cash and I'd be like oh I should pay you like it it I want to say it felt wrong. It didn't felt wrong. It felt too good to be true. And that's the difference. And that is a block that I've had to massively overcome in my uh, teaching days and in this business. It is such a pleasure. Working never feels like work. Doing this masterclass for you tonight, this literally is my absolute pleasure. I love it. I love, love, love what I do so much. And sometimes I, even though I do so much work in my mind, I still get thought with going feels too good to be true so that can be a real block feeling guilty around loving what you do like there are people who have jobs that they hate have you ever had a job that you hated I have it's a shit feeling it really is and then you're like oh my job is so awesome I love it and you know there's other people who hate their jobs and that can make you feel bad that can make you feel guilty now not doing such a physical job now don't get me wrong, I appreciate that treating horses all day and all dogs and people is physical. I'm comparing this to if you've ever done yard work and you've marked out 20 stables in a day, treating horses is not quite as grueling. I'm not saying you guys have it easy, not by a long stretch, but if you've been in the yard scenario and now you're not heaping wheelbarrows of heavy wet straw left, right and centre all day, it can feel like, oh, this is pretty easy. Like, it got easy. And then you can feel bad that there are some people working with horses having it much harder than you. Being easy. This was something that came up for me recently. I was just like, it feels too easy. Oh, oh, it feels too easy. And I was like, no, 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 I want it to be easy. Does it feel too easy? And then you feel bad. If you've watched other people struggle, particularly in your younger days, you know, maybe your parents really struggled. Um, maybe somebody you were close to, a family member, family friend, you watched them struggle. They worked long hours, low pay. It was, it was hard. You can then feel guilty when you've got the money that you want or you're getting to the money that you want and you are still playing with your kids, home in time to watch whatever you want on TV. You know, you're not struggling and you shouldn't be struggling. But if you've seen that, you can then feel bad that that's not you. Um, 
yeah loving what you do particularly when you know others hate their job so this is the stuff you need to shift okay so I really hope everybody has done some mental digging cleared out some money blocks and knows what they need to work on yeah if you've got any questions stick them in the chat okay back to the high ticket offer so we talked about what it was what it wasn't we've done some digging we've released some money blocks now let's get into the how to let's get into some nitty gritty so what could you offer to who and how to price it is what i want to talk about next now i want to also mention online versus in person I love helping people create stuff online. Why? Because it gives you flexibility. It allows you to reach people anywhere in the world. But for you to get started with a high ticket, it can just be in person. You can have online stuff. You can have high ticket online stuff. But for today, I let's just talk in person. I want this to feel easy. I want this to feel doable. I'm certainly gonna run another session on how to take part of your business online because I feel every practitioner should have, if they wish, an online element to their business. It makes your life so much easier. It really, really does. But for today, let's just talk in person. So it's creating a new package based on what you currently do, yeah? So first question to ask yourself, is what are your clients struggling with? Because whatever you're bringing out there, it needs to be the answer to somebody's prayers. It needs to be filling in the blanks. It needs to be giving them what they can't get or do right now. So what is it, your clients, I want everyone sticking this in the chats. Let's go guys. What are they struggling with right here right now this is that minute what are people stuck on because you need to know the answer to this uh in order to know what people need because a high ticket offer is luxury a high ticket offer is exclusive a high ticket offer is giving them more but you need to know what their problems are yeah so going back to the vip option that shows the membership you know like the exclusive bits that shows I don't want to queue for the toilet for 15 minutes and then find us out of toilet paper. I don't want to queue 20 minutes to get the kids a hot chocolate or myself a cup of green tea. I want to be able to see, like if I'm going, I want to do it properly. So maybe struggle isn't the, quite the word in that circumstances, but you can see those are my problems. I don't want to queue. I want to comfy sit. I want to stand up. I want to sit on the wet grass. I want enjoy the show with a bit of comfort and a nice fancy toilet and be able to get my tea easily and if it's included even better yeah so I, i'm not i don't feel i'm asking for much those are my issues and with the packages that these shows offer they fit my criteria oh and i also want parking close because if i've got to carry the kids and all their coats and stuff i don't need luck in that miles away so you can see how those are my struggles those are my problems those are my pain points how the VIP membership at a show, ticket at a show reaches that. Okay, <clears throat> understand the connection to their horse. So that's what, is that their struggle? So what is their struggle? So that's what they want. They want to understand the connection to their horse cat. So what is their struggle? They're disconnected, they don't understand their horse, their horse isn't doing what they want, they're scared of their horse, they feel disconnected. What is it they want? Keeping horses sound, feeling, performing well, particularly during competition so they can't they need to keep the horse on the road okay post-surgery rehab brilliant so what is it about post-surgery what is it they're struggling with they don't know what to do they don't know how to do it they're scared of doing it wrong drill into that vicky being really clear doing exercises independently great so what exercises they don't know what to do they don't know how to do it they can't be bothered to do it what is it they need so exercising let's say it's exercising people just to give you an example of how i work the i like an online exercising app for sure but the one that works absolutely best is one that uh, one of my friends launched she was a former client um that i used to teach years ago knowing that she was behind it and she had done these exercises really well so she just always knew when to sort of shout but 
it felt like she was in the room. I felt like I'd be in trouble if I wasn't doing it. And she would also send me messages from time to day. Oh, hey Nick, how you getting on? Are you like, you still doing this program? And I'll be like, oh, oh yeah, I must go and do, must go and do it again or something. So <clears throat> I, for me, with exercising, I need the how to do it. So I need to, someone to show me the exercises, but I need my butt kicked. I need a bit of accountability. So that worked really, really well. Um, so keeping horse and rider sound and performing. So what, what is it they can't do right now, Jess? The riders aren't keeping themselves fit. The riders are breaking. The horses aren't staying sound. The, the riders don't know how to keep the horses sound. The, the, there's lots of performance for riders, for horses. Get clear. As always, focus on over-delivering. I worry that I would have to reduce. Ah, okay. Really interesting point. Right. No, you wouldn't because you're, you, would, you don't have to offer less treatments to be able to give more VIP option, yeah? Because you're not going to offer your high ticket offer to that many people. It is not going to be for everyone. You could have one high ticket space a month. You don't have to knock off 10 regular treatments to fit in one VIP session. And remember, your high ticket offer is not giving them everything. If you're already an over deliverer, if that's even a word, you need to be super clear on your boundaries. If you're already giving people stuff, for, all this stuff for free, this is your time to make a change. For example, if an appointment is normally 60 minutes, uh, but somehow you feel like you should just sort of make it 90 and then people just call you up and ask for free advice and people are in your messages all the time. And then you, I don't know, you throw in all this extra stuff. This is your time to be, <clears throat> to say, okay, I've got a change. Something really exciting is coming. You can either have this, this service, which now costs X, or you can have this package, which is the 60 minute session and whatever else you want to include. Yeah. So this is a really cool time for you to make a big change in your business. If you're already over delivering, you've got to, it's not just stop doing that, package it up so people pay for that. Because you basically, you've, you're kind of giving people a high ticket offer, you just forgot to charge them for it. Um, exercises, I find they don't know what to do or how to do it. So what else is it, Dana, that they're struggling with that? Is it they don't want to do it? Is it they, they lose motivation? Because you could answer their problems with a video, with a free video on a, here's how to do it. Most people need more than the how to. They need to be held accountable. And that is what people will pay for. Because if you do not do the exercises or do the work on your business, do the written homework, do the physio uh, exercises, you aren't going to get the results. And people pay for the results. So you need to give them the solution. Um, doing what they're doing or doing the exercises correctly, don't have the time, hand holding. Yeah, brilliant. Vicky, that's really, really good. So some people, it's they need their hand held and other people, it's just like, I can't do that. Like I physically can't fit that in. Can you do that for me? So I feel that some really obvious high tickets are done for you and accountability and support because this is what you're all saying. You're saying people, they can't, stick to it basically so they're going to fall into they need more accountability and then there's people that are just like that's not even on my radar I'm so busy I don't know how I don't even I'm not even going to find out how I can't really factor that in and I think with rehab that can be a real issue if you are having a pretty action-packed life and then someone's like ah oh, now you've got to fit in x y and z that can feel too much so done for you i.e I will come and do whatever needs doing for the horse or dog can be really beneficial. So get clear, get super clear on what people's struggles are. I'll give you an example of what would work really well for me right now in my horsey life as a high ticket offer. Uh, I've got a lovely friend who's a riding instructor. She is absolutely fantastic. And if she packages up for me, I'll be like, oh yes, please. I 
I don't, oh, so I, have, I rode today, which is really exciting. I haven't ridden for a couple of weeks. I've been away. And as I said, everything's tend to receive mud and doesn't really feel that appealing. If she said to me, right, you can pay me X a month and every single, whatever day, week, day of the week, we'll have a session. If it's raining, if you're busy, if you just don't feel like it, I will still come and work the horse and you can have a lesson on the days you want a lesson. But the horse, every Tuesday at one o'clock, the horse will get worked. I'll be like, oh, amazing. I would feel like that took so much pressure off me because the horse is going to get training. Either that's with me there or without me. That would be great. And that's something that so many of you could offer. You could offer to go and treat a horse if that's what needs doing. But you may, uh, I know this has worked really well for one of my former clients. You could go and do some training with the horse, some groundwork, some long work, long lining exercises, pole work. Maybe you also ride for people. Maybe you teach. Like there's so much you could be doing. So that was just another example of what I feel like I'm struggling with. I don't feel like I'm riding enough to like warrant a lesson. I'm in that vicious cycle. Yeah, I need the, I would love some more help and input. Um, you never stop learning to you, but I don't feel like I'm writing enough to kind of warrant it. Whereas if she was like, right, I'm just going to come every week, which I feel like, oh, I don't want to listen every week. And she's taking some of the pressure off. That would be amazing. Can you see how that works? Okay. So what are people struggling with and what do people want to pay for? That is another question to ask yourself. Now, watch that your money blocks are not answering this question. Because it's so easy for people to say, oh, well, you know, that's all people can afford to pay me. People are like watching their budgets. Are they really? You will have some people that are literally like counting out the two Ps to pay for your session. And you will have people who are spending left, right and centre on all these other things in the horsey world. And they are happy to spend money. They just perhaps haven't seen the need to spend on your service. And that doesn't mean they haven't got the money. That means they haven't understood the value. Does that make sense to everybody? Because we assume if people, if you said to somebody, oh, shall I, do you want to just give me a call um, about your next session? And they leave it six months. We assume that they don't have the money to have you back sooner nine times out of ten that's not the case nine times out of ten they didn't see the need for you to come sooner you know it doesn't need to be six months you know whatever time frame they we assumed it was price yeah does that make sense we assumed it was money they didn't see the need they didn't see the point so it's not always about money but we make it about money does that make sense everybody if it doesn't please shout okay pricing so does everyone feel clear on something that they could offer? Yeah? It's really what people want to pay for and what people are struggling with. Because in the horsey world, people are paying for training. They are paying for supplements. They are paying to go on pole clinics. They are paying to do all these different things, new bits, rugs that a horse doesn't even need. They're paying for all this stuff why wouldn't they pay you? It's, it's only your money blocks stopping you. So all you need to do is put something together, which is the solution that people need and that they can see the results. It's all about leading with the results. So thinking back to some of your comments as to what people are struggling with, keeping the horse on the road. Okay, keeping it sound for competitions, getting better performance. Well, that would be really simple. You could be putting together like pre-competition package where you're seeing the horse more frequently. Maybe you're seeing the horse after the competition as well. Post rehab, people either want it done for them or they want high touch. You literally at their, not at their beck and call totally, but you, you're a bit more of your availability, you answering their calls, having some scheduled calls, so you can help them walk them through them and guide it, yeah? Is this making sense to everybody? It's simply, what is their problem? How are you the solution? And then 
we're going to come to pricing it because that's something I find people struggle with. Um, what do you think about sending a satisfaction feedback survey to your clients? Um, I think I can have some merits, but why do you need to do that, Lucille? What is it you're trying to find out? Are you trying to find out what your clients are struggling with? I wouldn't send them a survey. I would just simply get on the phone and ask them or talk to them in person. The thing with sending out a questionnaire is people just don't generally do it. That is the problem with that. Okay, so we're clear on what they're struggling with, what people need, and so what we can put in that offer. Now, how do you price it? So these are common pricing mistakes I find people make. They either price higher than they believe in they don't really feel aligned they like pluck a figure that they want but they don't quite believe in it so then they feel really awkward then they do random discounting or nobody buys at that price so then they're like oh i knew this wouldn't work because all the time your mind is trying to is trying to prove you right so it's not that pricing high doesn't work not at all pricing higher than you believe in than you feel aligned to is an issue Pricing too low and then feeling like really resentful, feeling like I'm pretty much doing this for free is an awful feeling. And then there's people where they're just like price safe. They've like researched every other person in the area and they're just like, yeah, I'm just gonna be exactly the same or maybe tiny bit cheaper, like totally safe. And now that can be a good starting point, pricing safe. But the problem with that is it's then harder to have more coming in, more flowing in. So any of those pricing issues sound familiar? I'd love to know. So I mentioned this, the problem, the reason that people don't, people don't, we think people can't afford something. We, people, we think it's always about the money. Generally, it's more people don't see the need. Sometimes, no, they can't afford it. But quite often, it's people don't see the need for something, but we make it into they can't afford it more than the first one. If they don't see the need, the reason it's nicer to believe they can't afford it is we don't, if they don't see the need, that's because we haven't explained why they need the service, what we are doing, what the results are, what the end transformation is, what the difference between you seeing the horse twice a year and you seeing the horse six times a year, what does that actually look like? You have not painted a clear enough picture of the success of how their, them and their horse could be in three months, six months, 12 months, if they had more regular treatments. But it's much easier to just be like, oh, they can't afford that. Yeah, does that make sense to everybody? That's why people don't go with for something. Maybe it's they can't afford it, but generally it's because they didn't see the need. And that is within your capability to change that. It really, really is. So horsey people have money to spend. Now, I have just grabbed a couple of screenshots of things that have just popped into my inbox in the last two days. So uh, you may be familiar with the brand Holland Cooper. I love their clothing. It's really lovely. It is high price. And this is really popular in the horsey world in the UK. I think it's becoming bigger and um, worldwide as well. Um, you know, she's a great example, Jade Holland Cooper, of launching an amazing brand. She started off selling tweed skirts at badminton many years ago. And all she was trying to do was like cover the cost of her pitch. And now she has a multi million pound empire, which is really impressive. But my point is that their, their stuff is in the hundreds. And people buy these lovely coats and breeches to go and get covered in, in poo and mud. People have money to spend. Olympia is a really big show that we have in, in London every year. I was discussing this with my friend I was riding with earlier. I looked at the tickets. Um, I think, oh, maybe I should take the children. I think I've decided they're a bit small. You, you don't get much change out of £100 for a four-hour performance. I think... The mid price tickets I was looking at were like 75 or 80. Um, and that was just for four hours. It was either the afternoon or the evening, three and a half hours or something. But that will be full. Yeah. People will spend money on that. So when you're like, oh, I don't know if people will go for this, people in the horsey world are spending money left, right, and center. We just feel like 
they can't afford our treatments. Yeah, we just feel like they don't want our service, but yet they're spending money on all these other horsey things. Horse and Hound Awards, that's an email that came into my inbox the other day. Look lovely. I thought, oh, I wonder what that costs because the new I was doing this training. I was like, oh, it's a really interesting example. 250 plus VAT, I think, plus, um, plus tax, I think it was for a ticket. I'm sure it's a great night out, but it is only one night out. Again, that will be full. People will spend on this. So why would they not spend money with you too? Yeah, it is really, really simple. There is money out there. People are spending money. You just have to release your money blocks, put the right thing in front of the right people and they will buy it. So instead of pricing to be safe, instead of pricing on fear, instead of pricing on keeping it totally safe, I believe you should price on firstly making sure you've covered your costs. That might sound really obvious, but what I find is people go, oh, well, okay, so if I'm going to do this amount for them, I should knock a bit off. I'm like, no, if I go to buy three saddles, if I go and buy a load of shopping in a supermarket, they don't go, oh, okay, I see you bought, I don't know, five bottles of wine, we'll just give you another one free. Yes, sometimes you do get deals like that, but it's not commonplace to offer more and then just, oh, I'll just chop a bit, I'll just cut a bit off, yeah? You don't need to do that. So make sure you've covered your costs because I see this time and time again, people go, oh, right, well, if I'm gonna do like six sessions and plus this and this, I should make it cheaper, right? I'm just like, no, you need to make sure you've covered your standard costs as it were. So cover your costs. Sounds obvious, but it's amazing what people don't do. Price on the value and the results. So too often people focus on the nuts and bolts of what they do. So I bet you've all done this. Oh, well, I come for an hour. Oh, I work on releasing this. I work on this. I've glazed over. I want to know, will China, is the name of the lovely little horse, sorry. I want to know, will China feel straight? Will China feel bendy? Will she stop feeling like a banana on the left rein? Will she feel softer, rounder, straighter, more forward? That's what I want to know. What is the end result? If your high ticket offer is to come and treat my horse more frequently, get me, help support me through this winter training period while I'm trying to train this horse more, I want to know like the results of that are gonna be, she progresses faster with her ridden training because you're keeping her feeling comfortable. She gets ready for that competition quicker. She recovers faster you don't get these niggling little grumbling things which put you back, yeah? So price on the value and the results that you're offering. That means that I get to ride more. And also think, what do you actually want to be paid? If you're honest, what is it you'd love to be paid? Do some work on this. I'd love to hear people's thoughts and I'd love you to go and do some journaling, reflect on these, what it is, you actually want to be paid. Because if you price, say you're suggesting your high ticket offer is, you want to go and treat this horse, let's say it's keeping a competition horse on the road, you're suggesting you treat it twice a month for three months of the competition season, plus a session before a big competition, like a small, shorter session before and after a big competition. So say you're seeing it twice a month, plus two extra sessions every other month or something like that, yeah? What is it you actually want to be paid for that? I would love you to actually go and work this out because so often people look at that figure of just covering the cost, look at that figure and then be like, oh, oh, can I charge that? Yes, you can. So do some reflection on this. I would love to see where people get to with this. Okay bringing it to life. So hopefully everyone has got some great ideas about what they can put in place. Because people pay for convenience, 
People pay for luxury. People pay for the experience. People pay for you to make their life easier. People pay for results. People pay for transformations. There's all these examples throughout every part of our life of what people will pay for. Uh, I've used this example so many times, but I'll use it again. I will happily pay when we run out of cat food, which even though my husband's like, have you ordered the cat food? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Then I'm like, oh, I've ordered the cat food, oh my goodness. I will pay <coughs> a ridiculous amount, which if I'd just been more organized, I wouldn't need to, for a timed delivery slot, because I've done this before. We literally ran out of cat food. I was able to pay for the 6 a.m. delivery slot so that Genghis, our lovely cat, got his breakfast on time. Yeah, I shouldn't have run out of the cafe, but I did. And I was happy to pay for the solution to my problems. So I probably was a waste of money, but you know what? I didn't care at that point. So I was like, why are we going to feed the cat in the morning? That solved my problems. So people will pay for their life to be easier. That's the premise of full livery. People will pay for results. Think about paying a personal trainer. You want to get in that wedding dress, feel better in your bikini, whatever it is. You will pay for someone to show you what to do, make you do it and hold you accountable. And you can bring the similar thing to life based on what your clients need. So how do you actually get this going? Decide, like work out what people need, decide how you want to package it up, then remove any blocks. So you feel guilty about charging people, you gotta do some work on that. What are all the reasons that you can't do this? Get them on a piece of paper, look at them. Is this really factually true? Will people definitely not pay me for this? Is it wrong to ask people for more money when I'm giving them more support and help? No, it's not. So get all that out on paper. Then you need to tell the right people which of your clients. So let's give some of the examples we've been given tonight. Post-surgery rehab. That you don't need to tell everybody about that. Obviously, if that's your high ticket offer, and I think it's a great offer, that you only need to tell the people whose dogs, horses are about to have surgery. Yeah, it's just not applicable to everybody. Remember, I said at the beginning, your high ticket offer is not for everybody. Let's use the competition example, the keeping these horses on the road. Well, if you've got people that just aren't, yeah, maybe they just compete now and again, but they're just not like be all and end all is not a competition maybe this isn't for them it's fine but the people that are like traveling hundreds of miles to get to the next qualifier that are just living and breathing the next show round this is for them so tell them about it tell them how you can help them and the biggest thing to help you bring to life is to stop deciding for people don't decide what they do and don't want don't decide what they can and can't afford. It's not their, it's not your business to be in their money business. Does that make sense? It you you will be amazed. People that you think will never go for something, but oh, that sounds great. Thanks. Brilliant. Boom. Sold. And the people you think it's maybe perfect for may not want it. So you need to, yeah, make sure it's appropriate for the people that you're telling. So there's no point telling people who have got a healthy dog bounding around about post-surgery support packages. Of course not. But don't, of all the people that you think fit the bill, don't decide for them. Because you could be doing yourself and your clients a massive disservice. Okay. Let's see where we are. Uh, Lucille, I would just ask them. I wouldn't worry about surveys. Just chat with them. What do they like? What do they need? Uh, price low, over to for resentful. Yes, so this is your time to stop doing that, Dana. Um, yeah, <laughs> so true. Who bought tickets for Olympia? I'm really tempted to go to Olympia. I think when I realised that I'd be paying like seventy pounds for my child's ticket particularly the smaller one, who'll just end up sitting on my knee. I was like, yeah, I think I just need to go on my own. Um, so, so, yeah, brilliant. Oh, loving reading everyone's comments in the chat. Fantastic. Okay, so does everyone feel clear about bringing this to life? Amazing. Right, two more bits for you. 
I've given you loads of information tonight and I understand that some of you might be feeling like, oh my God, what are we doing with it now? That is why, let me stop sharing my screen. That is why I've opened up some, some help packages for you. So I've opened up some free 15 minute training slots where you can get my help. So if you're like, oh yeah, this sounds great, but I don't know how to do it, I don't know what to do then I'm going to give you the link in the chat. Get yourself booked into one of these free calls. These are not sales calls. These are literally just my chance to give you an extra 15 minutes of help. So if you've got questions about how to get offer, if you're like, oh, sounds great, but if you've got some money blocks that are still bugging you, get yourself booked in. I have opened up all this space in my diary to help because I know that this session has been fab. I know people, some people will be like, ah, what do I do now? So I didn't want to leave you hanging is, is basically why I've opened these up. So get yourself one of these booked in. Now, extra fun bit, I can introduce my special guest. Kat is going to chat with us now about high tech offers. Kat, I am going to start off by saying how you realized when we first started working together that what, what you thought you wanted wasn't what you wanted. You didn't want to be treating 20, 30 plus horses a week. You wanted something different. We did loads of work on what you could bring to life. It felt really, really scary. You did loads and loads of work to make it stop feeling scary. And then you started selling them. And this is amazing. And I've got loads of fab, fab clients that are doing this, but I'm so grateful to Kat for joining us this evening. So let me introduce Kat to you. So Kat, take it away. You have all these different ways you help horses, massage therapist, natural horsemanship, whole load of stuff. So tell us, where you were in business, tell us how the high ticket offer came to life and tell us how cool it is that you've sold it all out as well. Hey, can you hear me? Hello. Okay, amazing. Hello. Oh my gosh. So like, just excited to be on here. Um, so have you. Oh my gosh. Loved it, by the way. Amazing. Thank you. Um, oh, when I met you, I had just got the courage to become an equine massage therapist because I always wanted to work in equine industry, but I was really scared because obviously everyone told me there's no money in horses. Like all my family were like, you're mental. None of them are horsey. Um, and I was like, it was locked down. I was like, I'm going to do it anyway. So I did my course and I was like, great, I'm going to go out and I'm going to earn loads of money and I'm going to have the best life. And then it was exhausting um and I was overgiving, undercharging like I did so many for free because I just oh we just lost you for a second Kat you were just saying sorry Kat we just lost you for a second over delivering undercharging you back oh Kat you've just gone a little bit robotic so over delivering, um, under charging. And I, um, can you still hear me? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You were just saying over delivering, oh, under charging. My internet, my internet. Don't worry, is don't so worry. <laughs> Hopefully we can hear you, but if not, let's, let's see if we can hear what you are saying. So you were over delivering, under charging. Can you hear me now? Sorry, like, my internet. How am I going to get awful. out of this mess? <laughs> yep. Yes. And I was exhausted. Um, and I was like, oh, everything I believed is true. I'm never going to make it in the horse industry. Um, and yeah, and, and I was just, I didn't know where to go basically. And then I chatted to you and um, I thought about my dream job. Like you kind of prompted me to think about if, there, if money was no object and I could design my dream day, my dream schedule, what would it look like? And I decided that I loved equine massage, but my passion was actually in understanding horses and humans and more kind of in the coaching as like area. But there wasn't a job for me yet. Like it wasn't created. 
And that was really scary because I was like, well, I can't follow in anyone's footsteps. Um, and then, yeah. And then we were just like, okay, go for it. Because I was kind of thinking, oh, maybe in five years time, 10 years time, and I'll kind of push through with the massage. Oh yeah, I remember you saying, yeah. Yeah, this yeah. sounds great. Yeah, I'll do it in five years. <laughs> yeah, I was like, this sounds amazing, but I'm not now. <laughs> and then you were like, just do it because I had massive imposter syndrome. Um, I didn't think I was going to be good enough at the job. And when you introduce high ticket offers, that was really scary. But actually for coaching as well and equine massage, but it allowed me to give more um, to my clients and go on the journey with them. Because I found that when I didn't believe that people would want me back, so I'd kind of see loads of random people and not actually get the enjoyment of getting to know them or their horses. And then I couldn't help as much because I didn't know what they needed. Yeah, totally. You just didn't get to build that same relationship at all when you're dipping in and out. And I think oh, we might have lost you briefly, Kat. And I think so many people feel that like, they don't feel people will want them back and they feel like they can't uh, ask awesome. to come back. Yeah. Sorry, Nicola. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I was just saying how so many people feel that. They, yes. they feel like it's almost like an intrusion mm -hmm. to say, oh, right, I'll be back in six weeks or whatever. And it always seems to be at the barrier, you know, like it, yeah. they need you back. Totally. So imposter syndrome was a big yeah, issue yeah yeah and we, then, we then I developed a high ticket offer and I love mm, yeah um and then yeah and then I moved past that with lots of work from you um and I designed my high ticket offer and actually now I love asking people to pay me because it means that I can really be there for them and really understand them and their horse it's like a two-month program um and I've formed amazing relationships and actually made such a difference in people's lives which is something I never thought I could do because I was just kind of oh like do you want me to come and treat your horse maybe I'll come again in three months but I probably won't ask because I'm too embarrassed um and yeah and and I'm excited about where my business can go now whereas before I remember looking at you <laughs> looking through the numbers with you and realizing how many I had yeah I remember you, I remember so clearly you saying I don't want to treat 20 horses and I was like terrified I was like this will make me excited it makes me feel sick whereas now I'm like, ah exactly Whereas now I'm like, oh, there's so much more room. There's so much more energy yeah. to give. So yeah. It's yeah. scalable, isn't it? And and the fact that you've got your high ticket offer and at the moment, actually, you don't even have that much time, do you? Because mm. you're really busy. You're pretty yeah. much, you know, got full kind of occupied, almost full time. Yeah. So you've managed to still make some really good money in your business, but it fit in around other massive commitments that you've got going on right yeah. now. Yeah. And that is just perfect. You know, you, yeah. your business has not suffered from you being really busy with another project. No. It's grown, but you haven't had to work yourself to, a, to the bone to do that. Yeah. Oh, and so that's... amazing. Well, I hope that really inspires everybody because I cannot tell you how resistant Kat was when we oh, first started putting this together. Yeah. She has literally gone from you are joking to yeah, loving this, opening yeah. up another space next week because my other clients have finished. Yeah. In in really quite a short space of time. Yeah. And everyone can do this too. Yeah. It is so doable, so possible. It's getting um, yourself out of your own way is your first thing. It really, really is. I think that's the biggest, biggest thing is believing that you can do it and that people will pay it. It's probably the biggest starting point for everyone to move forward. Kat, any other final words of advice you'd like to leave everybody with? Oh, we may have any other yeah, final and thoughts you'd like to also, leave everybody with? Yeah, um, so what what you were saying about where I am now, I'm in, I'm literally live, I'm living with my 
favorite horsemanship professional. I'm working for her. I'm training with her. And, and I only need one client a month to make sure that I can, you know, support myself. And, you know, this, obviously this is not forever and I'll grow my business and, and, but this is my training. This is my development. And just knowing that I only need one, one new client a month and at, you know, one every other month will be fine. And it's such a relief because I can go out and, you know, grow myself and my horsemanship coach, amazing client. So yeah. I love that. Oh, that is absolutely amazing. I absolutely love it. Kat, thank you so much for thank you. inspiring everybody, being living, walking, talking, high to get off. I love it. Brilliant. Well, as I said, if anyone has been left thinking, oh, how do I do this? Get yourself booked onto one of these free calls. If you've already booked yourself a session, could you just make sure you've added either your Facebook name or your email address so we can send you the link? Um, some, I'm just looking at who's grabbed a call. Some people I can find, some people I'm not sure we've got your details on file. So could you just leave your email address in that spreadsheet or message it to me if you don't want to share it on there? just so I have it because I don't want to be going, oh great, I'm going to talk to who? Uh, and not be able to send you the details. So look out for a message from Mary, my assistant. She'll send you over the Zoom link to join those calls and can't wait to help everybody further. Thank you so much for everyone's time on the call tonight. It's been absolutely fantastic. You can, guys can do this too. You really, really can. It is so possible so doable and I can't wait to help you further so I'm going to leave you all now some of you I'm speaking to tomorrow and enjoy the rest of your day rest of your evening take care everybody lovely to see you all goodbye